Hello, the recursive community. My name is Elena and I'm the country lead in Romania, the recursive. Today I am going to be your host while I pick the brains of a founder who is aiming to revolutionize in-store advertising with robots. Ionuț Vlad is the co-founder of Tokinomo, a technology company that uses sensors, motion, light and sound to bring shelf products to life and increase shopping engagement. No wonder the disruptive startup has received various awards like Impact Star by Deloitte and Most Eventive Startup by Lafresh Tech Romania in 2022. With a background in graphic design and fine arts, Ionuț honed his craft as an art director at Saatchi and Saatchi before launching his own game-changing project. Hello Ionuț and thank you for joining the podcast today. Hello Elena and uh, hello uh, your uh, you know uh, followers and uh, various social platforms. I'm very glad to be here. Oh, we're happy to for for you to join us. And since you mentioned before starting the, the podcast that you play games, let's also play an imagination mm-hmm. game. Can you walk us through your customer journey in a supermarket these days? What makes you choose a product over the other? And how has this changed for the better or worse uh, since joining the marketing field? Mm-hmm. Actually, this is uh, very core to our business. So this actually is the kind of the root of our uh, idea and and product. Because uh, what uh, I've noticed by uh, actually spending countless hours in supermarkets and other types of stores, I got the chance to actually watch the shopper's behavior and what they are doing. And... uh, I kind of drawn my own conclusions. I'm not sure if everybody agrees with me, but uh, uh, I think the most important uh, part of choosing a product is actually to uh, make that product visible. So mm-hmm. that's number one. And, uh, you know, typically a uh, guy from the marketing, from uh, some of the, you know, brands, they are investing a lot in uh, in the brand, in the packaging, Uh, also you know the price uh, plays of course a big uh, role but uh, all this comes to nothing if the product is not visible you know it's basically and um, when you are actually going in, into a supermarket you are blind to most products simply mm-hmm. because you are mostly on autopilot mode so you actually don't uh, you have your own thought process so you don't really pay that much attention usually you have a mental list or a written list mm-hmm. and you try to kind of follow it but uh, outside of that uh, i mean there are in a supermarket thousands not thousands tens of thousands of products right so it's very hard to actually pay attention and also you are actually walking you're not uh, sitting mm-hmm. so you literally don't have the attention the attention span the uh, ability you know to see every product so basically uh, every product that is not seen it's a missed opportunity Mm -hmm. so this is why we came up with the solution trying to make the products more visible to give them somehow uh, you know an unfair advantage towards uh, their competitors because Mm -hmm. they kind of uh, it's hard to not notice the product when you are using uh, our uh, our solution so and i don't think that uh, has changed because this is like uh, You know, human nature is not, I mean, uh, starting from when the supermarkets were invented, I think it was like, I don't know, the first supermarkets probably, I don't know, mid-war, uh, between the wars or right after the war. So I, I don't think uh, much has changed actually in this kind of uh, behavior. So the shelves are, you know, pretty much there. Uh, people are trying to use different ways to entice the shopper to buy the product but uh, otherwise the shopper journey more or less more mm-hmm. or less is not that different thank you i understood the 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 entrepreneur journey but i definitely want to tap into your your journey mm. what's the last thing that you went in a supermarket and bought and why did you pick that product over another one was it mm-hmm. the color was it maybe it's a bias you know you in the middle is is the most high end product and oh. on top is expensive lower mm-hmm. cheaper Let me think, let me think. Actually, it's a good product, a uh, good question, sorry. Um, actually, last time I was in a supermarket, I had a very specific list because I was very much in a hurry. Mm-hmm. So I was missing a couple of things and uh, I went kind of straight to the point and then mm-hmm. got out. So 
it wasn't maybe the typical shopper journey, but uh, yeah, so. Um, Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, yes, okay. So you don't want to tell us there was maybe wine or chips. Your what, what do you eat when we play? Well, I will tell you, of course, <laughs> you know, like uh, healthy bio food and uh, uh, also ethical food. You know, kale chips and yeah. avocado toast, right? Right. Uh, of course, I buy. I bought so soda and chips and uh, chocolate, but uh, mm -hmm. that's uh, I'm not going to uh, admit this in front of the camera. So. Um, you 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 play with technology you work in technology but uh, how, where do you draw the line uh, to how far technology should be integrated in your life mm -hmm. both professionally and personally mm -hmm. well i think despite the hype with the te technology in the last few I don't know, years uh, for me technology is not is nothing by itself you know it's not technology for the sake of technology it serves to a purpose right mm -hmm. so uh, that was the case in uh, for us I mean when we started we didn't have the idea okay let's do a technology tech startup you know mm -hmm. for us it was more like solving a problem in the space that we were familiar with and we did that by using technology because that was the you know, the smartest way or the best way that we thought, you know, it was so. Uh, and I think the same goes for almost everything. Uh, so uh, if it helps, then it's perfect. If not, then, I don't know, pen and paper, it's equally fine. By the way, pen and paper, there were very much technology in like, mm -hmm. you know, 15th century. So, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, this is how I look at technology and also actually I'm not sure if that relates to your question or not but I just want to say that in my case it was an interesting journey because I'm coming from a creative background so mm -hmm. I studied arts I'm actually a professional painter mm -hmm. so I did like from uh, you know to the animation uh, from graphic design as you mentioned art direction uh, I don't know, a lot of mm -hmm. stuff in the creative uh, area so I wasn't necessarily in the tech sector knowing much about although I uh, did some programming just as a hobby you know and uh, but I wasn't by any means uh, professional but I didn't know anything about uh, electronics about uh, this kind of stuff so uh, but I've noticed something quite interesting that my creativity I think helps a lot because uh, I think the best uh, engineers have this creative uh, approach to things because otherwise uh, they wouldn't uh, invent stuff, new stuff and think of because there are always challenges. Mm -hmm. So if you are kind of a stickler to the rules, you will always come up with the same stuff. While if you are creative, you're, you're trying to bypass certain uh, obstacles, mm -hmm. then the creative mind uh, you know, comes into play. And I think these two things are very much related. Mm -hmm. I would love to take you one step further to to, to, to walk us through your entrepreneurial journey. Uh, when did you feel like the bug bites you to, to develop um, as an art director and their transition to uh, founding Tokinomo? What are the, the core pillars there? Art director, founder, when, when did it start? Was it a specific moment mm -hmm. in time? Do you remember it? Yes. I, Can you paint I, it for us? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I'm not sure because I didn't uh, quite paint in a long time, but... Uh, I used to work uh, for a lot of years in advertising mm -hmm. and uh, at some point I must admit that I got kind of, uh, not sure if bored is the right word, but I, I couldn't see myself doing the same stuff, you know, and uh, I always, I think, had this bug of starting my own thing, mm -hmm. so that is one. Uh, secondly, uh, I... Even in, in my family, I had some examples of, uh, I mean, my father, my uncle, they, all, they, were tr they tried and some of them quite successfully tried to be entrepreneurs in the 90s, 2000s, mm -hmm. so a long time ago, but there was a bug, I think, in the family, you know. And then, uh, of course, the, uh, I had this, uh, I don't know, uh, my search for ideas, for... Uh, Okay, what I'm gonna do now? I'm I'm not really. I don't want to be an art director anymore. So what should I do? 
And then, of course, some, uh, usually this is how it is in life. There are opportunities, uh, and when the time is right, they kind of appear in front of you. And it's important kind of to try to grab them. So I, and after I left such and such, I used to work for a retailer, mm -hmm. uh, being in charge with the private labels. And this is where actually I spent a lot of time watching the shoppers behavior and what they were doing. So I, I noticed right away this gap, like lack of visibility and what makes a, a shopper prefer certain products versus others, mm -hmm. right? Which are not quite apparent. I mean, not surprise. It's pretty simple, but not a lot of people uh, kind of think that way, you know? So, mm -hmm. Uh, all these experiences combined, so working in advertising, doing in-store campaigns for large brands, working for a retailer, and me uh, trying to find that idea that will uh, make me um, yeah, an entrepreneur somehow, mm -hmm. uh, led to this uh, idea of, uh, you know, help physical brands be more visible and as a second layer actually getting a life on their own and let them interact with the shoppers. Mm -hmm. And one step further into building, th th tell us about the process of launching mm -hmm. Tokinoma from ideation to funding to expansion, because yeah. I know you're present in over 40 countries. What were some of the challenges that you faced and uh, how did you move forward with them? Okay. It's a good thing that you mentioned some of the challenges because I, if I were to tell them all, uh, you would ideation, need a lot ideation. Of, uh, <laughs> you, you told us, you told yeah. us how the idea came to fruition. Uh, yeah, I think. Uh, look, at uh, the, the beginning, I didn't have uh, honestly so big expectations. Mm -hmm. I was more like uh, you know exploring, and I thought, yeah, maybe you know something good will turn out of this, and I will make some money, and uh, that's it. So. It wasn't, uh, I didn't uh, env envision this kind of, uh, you know, global thing, a lot of people, uh, all this stuff, so funding and not, nothing uh, of that kind. So it was, I was caught by surprise somehow by the evolution. It started when, uh, so I've read actually some, some books. I was uh, trying to learn more about the startup ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to develop something. I wasn't quite sure how and why and what is financing and I was very much, I don't know, naive somehow. Uh, but I've met some people uh, and then I heard this idea that you need to validate your product. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I searched, again, I wasn't at that time at least a tech, tech guy, so I had to search from some people with some skills to develop a, a very primitive prototype just to mm -hmm. kind of, you know, show the idea. And I started to, you know, pitch it to some potential clients, to some, you know, guys that I thought would be relevant. And uh, at some point we got uh, actual, you know, like contracts, mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, without uh, having the product. And so that was, I think, a good validation uh, of criteria. And when the people are actually willing to pay money, for something even if it's uh, really, you have a, pro a primitive product kind of. And uh, then, so that that is one, uh, one moment. Then we heard that a good way to, you know, start a startup would be to go to an accelerator. Mm -hmm. So we applied for some and we were accepted by a US-based accelerator. So we went, uh, me and my co-founder Lawrence in the United States for like four months. It was a crazy journey. <laughs> uh, completely wrong state, I would say now, but still we've uh, learned there the ABC of, uh, you know, founding a startup. And this actually, that was the moment when we uh, quit our jobs because other, uh, we were working up until then. So. And uh, we didn't know anything, you know, like equity, funding, why, I mean, uh, vesting, oh, what is that? I mean, why, how, I'm, I need to have all the shares right now. What are you talking about vesting? What's mm -hmm. that? You know, are you yeah. trying to trick me or something? <laughs> so that was the you know, process. And um, then we got back in Romania. We had some more clients, campaigns. And then we thought, okay, if we really want to do this, we need to have some... Uh, investors and uh, look for some uh, 
you know, funding. And luckily for us, we didn't struggle so much with this. Uh, I think uh, something that helped us was that uh, the fact that we already had some proof of revenue, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so it was more than an idea. But we didn't have a product. I mean, the product was just a prototype at that stage. And uh, also during that period, I we start. I, I decided, okay, if we want to build the business, we we need a team. You know, like uh, we cannot rely really on external people to help us with the technology. So also, luckily for me, I had some uh, pretty good friends that each had, he, he, and they still have the, uh, their own skills, complementary skills, like one was passionate about product design and the mechanics. The other one was uh, into software. Uh, we didn't have a, uh, an electronic engineer, but we found one. Uh, actually, it's a funny story. I found him on the street. <laughs> so, uh, it was, uh, yeah, I, th I think I uh, told this story already, but it was in, a, in an electronics shop. I was looking for some components, and there was this guy who was speaking with the shopkeeper, and he was looking, he, he sounded very smart to me, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, approaching like, uh, hey, you want to work with <laughs> for yeah, me? Okay. And uh, he still does, you know. He mm -hmm. still, to this day, he works for us. So, um, yeah, I think so after we, you know, g gather around this, uh, you know, small team of people, we got the f uh, founding we needed. Uh, also, I think we got uh, fortunate somehow that we met the right people, the right investors, uh, which is, uh, I mean... What made them right? I think the attitude, uh, the fact that they were very somehow trying to help and uh, be positive and uh, not uh, uh, looking for faults, but rather uh, trying to correct the things that you were missing by being uh, supportive somehow mm -hmm. rather than uh, critical. And um, so I think actually I could name a name, Malin. I think I, Malin Stefanescu, who is also the president of Tech Angels, I think he was uh, quite instrumental in the, you know getting the first and the, also the following rounds. But uh, maybe... I mean, some other startups don't have this the same mm -hmm. luck, you know. Because I think uh, in the in the early stage, it's important to have some uh, investors that are uh, kind of cooperating with you, working with you somehow, not uh, being supportive mm -hmm. and uh, not seeing this only as a, a quick investment and just for uh, you know the quick win. How how long uh, did you bootstrap before letting angel investors join? Well, the... One year, mm -hmm. so that was yeah. But yeah, we, we put our uh, skin in the game initially. So, mm -hmm. and I, I definitely want to tap more. You give if you have on top of your mind a challenge that you overcome during this scaling period. Mm -hmm. um, let me think of the biggest. So, uh, obviously, one of the things is, uh, is the cash flow. Mm -hmm. But in our case, it's even more important because we also have this harder component, mm -hmm. which is, uh, makes everything double or triple more difficult. So, that, that is one. Uh, and with the hardware, you, you cannot iterate that easily. You, know, mm -hmm. you, you, you really want to nail the product. Uh, before you scale, because in software, yeah, you can have a bug, but then, you know, you, you can solve it. Mm -hmm. But with hardware, it's like, that's pretty much it. I mean, if you uh, Factory mess it up. that order. Yeah, but, <laughs> so that is one. Uh, then I would say, uh, well, finding the right team, I think it's all because, okay, we were a couple of, uh, I think, good guys to this day. Actually, I, I wasn't aware at that time, but now, I, I could I can see now that we were a valuable team. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, the core team was uh, made out of uh, people with uh, strong skills. And I was I mean, initially I thought you know yeah okay I have this group of friends. Coincidentally, I had to work with them, but I couldn't compare them with anything. Right uh, up until we got the chance to work with you know other high skill professionals and realized that actually my guys were pretty good, if not better, no? mm. in some areas, of course. 
Uh, so that is that. And what was the question? <laughs> About scaling, challenges yes, while scaling, scaling the company. Uh, to yes, so the, the team of, outside of the core team, I think finding the right people, it's always a challenge. Mm -hmm. So that is like a... It's like uh, sandpaper, you know, you need to grind and to always polish the right team. You mm -hmm. know, it's very hard. I mean, the more people you are, the harder it is somehow to get the right balance between motivation, skill, uh, you know, hardworking, uh, nice guys. You know, it's, it's always a challenge. And I think any kind of founder would say that no matter what the stage. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is that. Obviously, uh, oh, logistic in our case, logistics, shipping, exporting, which we didn't know anything about it. But imagine right now, uh, actually, we have some, uh, uh, we are having this event and we are preparing some cool numbers. Like uh, we did, uh, I don't know, hundreds of exports outside Romania and uh, it is uh, so hard in some countries. I mean, mm -hmm. you don't actually imagine European Union what what uh, kind of like a paradise it is from that perspective, at least. Okay. I mean, shipping uh, anything in some places, it's like, I don't know. Like what? Like Where? Like America or Asia? I wouldn't name names, <laughs> but okay. outside Europe, for sure. Outside Europe, okay. And it's... Uh, all the logistics and mm -hmm. the, the approvals from the you need to have approvals from the government. Uh, I don't know, it's crazy, really crazy. Mm -hmm. So that was one thing that uh, is uh, well, it certainly makes things harder when it's about scaling. Um, what else? Of course, I mean, look what is going around. It, that like it was the best and the worst time to find a, to found a startup you know, like uh, you know pandemic uh, crisis war everything so it's uh, good luck with that and hardware so and what but, else can you but you, it's good that you, you you have a support system you started your um, company with your brother brother-in-law you mentioned yeah. bringing on onboarding friends and people mm -hmm. you meet on in a, in a, in a market in a, in a shop yeah. in a way but that you felt that the person fits your your business yeah. culture in a way. So th I understand that this is in a way uh, uh, part of your business culture. And how I want to say something here. Sorry yeah. to interrupt you yeah. about my founder, co-founder, mm -hmm. who is my brother-in-law. That's a, quite an interesting story because mm -hmm. we, I think, we are uh, very different, like almost opposing uh, okay. personalities we have, uh, but. What was happening during all these years is that, uh, so I am generally more like the serious type, more organized, more rational, and uh, he's the funky guy, the crazy one, uh, you know, with the uh, hustler, you mm -hmm. know, and uh, he's of course more likable because he's an extrovert, I'm an introvert, I'm more like, in a, you know, like a mad scientist in my lab, I don't want, I don't like people, you know, he's like, ah, blah, blah, you know. The Italian kind of type, mm -hmm. and but we started to borrow things from the mm -hmm. other, you know, and we started somehow to form a good team, but with effort. So it wasn't easy. It wasn't like that. Mm -hmm. It was a process, and we almost split up at some point. But it was after we passed this difficult moment that we started to work really like a team. So I think there is a point, and if you are lucky enough to past that point, I think you're good, you know, because that's, I think, one of the re biggest risks when it comes to mm -hmm. having uh, multiple founders in a startup is that, uh, of course, you there is a big risk that you don't get along long term. So, uh, yeah, it was a person it's funny to see now that he became more organized. I became more, uh, you know, not, yeah, a little bit more extrovert trying, I mean, being able to, you know, speak with, uh, mm -hmm. you know, look, I'm here, like, Exactly, you're speaking in an interview, you yeah. received the words and went up on stage, yeah. I saw you going to events. Yes, so this is the challenge. This is the challenge that I was looking after. Yeah. Um, but I, I definitely want to sit a little bit more here because uh, communication team is highly important these days, especially when a company is growing. Uh, and you will, in the future, near future, grow your company even more. And I want to find out more about your business culture, the pillars. What do you look 
at when bringing new team members uh, to join this team, this core team, uh, so it doesn't d destabilize it in a way. Um, but also to support the new team members flourish. If you are too many introverts, mm -hmm. an extrovert will destabilize you. If you are too many oh. of the other mm -hmm. group, I think uh, I, I'm not sure if you can actually put a number on uh, you know extrovert and introvert. Like okay, we need to have five extroverts <laughs> and uh, four introverts, and the two uh, is difficult, you know. But mm -hmm. uh, somehow they can make a team somehow natural. I think there are other values though that you can uh, mm -hmm. you know learn to appreciate and cultivate. Uh, we have I, I'm not sure if at first we we it more was more down to our personal values that reflected to the mm -hmm. company and now we're trying somehow to build the company culture and to maybe sometimes you are we are doing it uh, intuitively so mm -hmm. not really on purpose but it uh, people are uh, being filtered out let's say in a way. So I would uh, name a few of those, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Please. values. I think it's uh, one of the most important things is honesty uh, in what we are doing and what we are, how we are uh, uh, behaving, and not uh, shortcutting in the wrong uh, sense, and trying to be as uh, honest with each other honest in business like you know paying the taxes and uh, not be you know uh, not uh, i don't know steal in any way or uh, being honest with the employees like don't trick them uh, being honest with partners with business i mean rather lose but uh, keep your integrity mm -hmm. rather uh, yeah and, uh, so uh, that is one which is i think i this is uh, one of the most important things, which is not so easy actually. In real business life, you get many chances to kind of somehow, you know, bend the rules. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that is one. Then I think uh, innovation and creativity plays a big part because, and that comes to the product somehow, and then reflects back to the you know people create product, and then the product somehow inspires the you know the people to create even more innovative stuff and we are trying to create unique stuff that nobody else did so we are not comfortable in copying what others did mm -hmm. and make them slightly better you know we just want to make something different which is better than what it used to be but which is completely different, you know, completely different. I mean, it's the same kind of general space, of course. Everybody has an industry, everybody has competitors in a way. Mm -hmm. But we don't try to make, uh, I don't know, a better table, you know. We are trying to make a piece of furniture that you, you never saw before. And mm -hmm. it's uh, better than a table, you know. Thank you. So we definitely tapped into the market. We tapped into the the, the founders and the mm -hmm. team and the values bringing you together. Uh, I want to move forward to the product because you kept mentioning the product. Do you remember the first draft of the robot? Yeah. And how how different is it compared to now? The pivoting moment. It's uh, so different. It's uh, it's ridiculous <laughs> how different it is because I, actually I, I have a funny story about that. So. Uh, one of the first prototypes, uh, it was with uh, some sort of uh, siding that you are using in buildings. You know, like uh, it's called the uh, bond or alco bond. I don't know. It's, you you find it on buildings. You know, mm -hmm. and we use that to make the uh, how do you say the box of the you know, mm -hmm. product. Let's say the outside cover, and uh, we used to work with. Uh, manufacturing company and uh, I sent the uh, layout the, you know I don't know it was like a technical drawing mm -hmm. and they uh, cut the to a CNC machine and they bent it so you know to ma make the box mm -hmm. and the guy called me and said look um, we had so much trouble with your stupid product i mean it's crazy we had people working for hours trying to make it right and it's, it's crazy i never had such a difficult product and i was like well, what's so difficult I mean, it doesn't seem that complicated to me and we, we've met with mm -hmm. that guy 
and uh, actually this guy kind of the software or he he uh, misinterpreted the uh, actually the I don't know millimeters with uh, centimeters or something like that oh. and it was 10 times uh, smaller and actually the guys so it was like this like a little box and the guys uh, painstakingly, uh, I don't know, manually uh, oh. put ed- every hole. It was like a beautiful miniature. Oh. <laughs> Do you like, still have it? Yeah, we still have it. It's Please crazy. send a picture. Yeah. It's crazy. And uh, so that was one. Uh, okay, another one was basically out of uh, wood. Uh, okay. So it was, that was interesting. Uh, luckily, they didn't uh, start a fire or something like that. Where do you produce it? Uh, where do we used to or where we are? Where did you used to and where do you produce now? Okay, we used to do it locally, mm-hmm. uh, 100% obviously, because we, there were prototypes. Uh, nowadays we are, uh, I mean, our main product, we are still uh, assembly it here in Romania, mm-hmm. but with some of the parts, of course, we are manufacturing in, uh, in other countries. Uh, and uh, the new products that are coming, it's a, it's a mix. So some of them are actually, we want to make it uh, outsource kind of completely and okay. the other one uh, a mix let's say mm-hmm. it depends on the product and the opportunity so we are always trying to find the best uh, mix of uh, quality control and uh, costs and uh, logistics so it's a you mentioned the shipping issues so I that understand. also actually by the way it's <laughs> a big hurdle these days so yeah um <clears throat> Now, let's dive a little bit into the solution. So, um, I know about the, the first Tokinomo solution, the robot, the mechanism, yeah. and this is shelf bot. Shelf bot, yeah. Shelf bot. Tell us about the two that you're going to announce. Okay. So, I don't announce them, you announce them. <laughs> right. Yeah, so actually, to the audience, we are going to have a big event, launch event on the 24th of March. So, everybody who could be interested, just uh, visit our, our page and you can uh, register there for our big global event. Uh, so we are launching two products. Uh, first one, it's uh, an alternative to the shelf robot, which is uh, kind of uh, smaller, more flexible, easier to scale, let's mm-hmm. say. Uh, and the concept is uh, what's up at the shelf. So basically you can uh, communicate, the product actually can communicate with you uh, via a physical form of WhatsApp, but also it then gets to mobile on your phone and you can chat with the product on your mm-hmm. phone. So it's like uh, from mobile to physical sp- space in, at the shelf mm-hmm. and then back to the mobile. So mm. it's a, What's the name? A Visi bubble. Visi because bubble. It, you make the product more visible and it's a speech bubble kind of. Cute. And the other one? Uh, the other one, it's a highly, highly advanced uh, shopper analytic tool. So basically, mm-hmm. we can tell a lot by uh, um, a platform that uses AI to get uh, anonymous information on the shop, not on particular shoppers, but, uh, you know, statistical data on how many shoppers have passed uh, and what were uh, what was their demographic pro- profile, their level of interest, their behavior, so what they did around the shelf, around your product, if they uh, uh, showed the interest towards the category or your product, if they saw your product or not. So all these kind of metrics we can provide, and uh, this has been uh, you know in the work for at least uh, I would say one or two years. So. It's uh, one of the solutions that I think, uh, as we are doing it, there is no other, uh, you know, solution at that standard of uh, accuracy and uh, privacy and this kind of. Uh, so we can use this solution together with our other two products, or uh, as a standalone, just to get the data. So mm-hmm. it's up to the, you know, clients, the brands, the retailers, how you they want to use it. I'm curious for and this one is called shopper scan. Shopper scan. I'm curious how, how so we have the, the, the mechanical part, the gadget. Yep. We have now the, the data. Uh, how from the market marketer's perspective, how will these integrate with marketing strategies, mm-hmm. social media strategies, influencer marketing? Mm-hmm. It's a, well, certainly we want to be part of the mix. We don't uh, have the intention to cover all aspects of mm-hmm. the you know, marketing, but I think they are quite complementary to each other. So 
Uh, for example, with the Shelfobot, you can get a lot of... Uh, so you have an interaction on the at the shelf in the supermarket, right? Mm-hmm. That we saw that actually generates a lot of uh, um, free media views, viral, because it gets on TikTok, gets on Instagram, so people are filming each other, and uh, then the brands actually get free exposure. Uh, then you have this uh, Visi bubble, which uh, it's... Uh, also much more you know cost effective and scalable and easy to install it runs on batteries so uh, we uh, shuffle what is like for highest impact if you want to um, for example launch a product or generate a lot of trial for your products to have maximum impact in sales and interaction then this is your uh, mm-hmm. you know uh, solution if you want on the other hand to have uh, like a day-to-day communication and to scale it make it really uh, you know on a mass you can use a VZ bubble anywhere, you know, like in pharmacies, gas stations, supermarkets, because it's very versatile. It's, it's small, it, it's, uh, you know, uh, it's fun, I think, also. Mm-hmm. Oh, by the way, one of the values, it's fun. I'm talking okay, about yeah. we're trying to, to make some uh, everything, uh, you know, uh, we are trying to smile and we are trying also to make other people smile. And we also don't take ourselves too, too seriously. So I think... Uh, maybe the data solution not so much, but the other two have uh, something, uh, I don't know, quirky, something, uh, you know, funny and, uh, and absurd somehow. It, they're kind of, uh, you know, between gadget, uh, toy and business serious solutions. So it's like a mix of uh, craziness and there. Especially for the young generations, which are like connected to technology. Yeah. They don't see, I mean, for maybe our parents, Seeing a robot in the supermarket, it will they will get it will get their attention, but yeah. they will be like, why? Okay, but for new generations, like they're second nature in a way. But I'm curious. Um, <laughs> so, I want to do a follow up. How did this um, new products come to be? Uh, were they part of like your strategy or part of feedback that you receive from users? That kind of yeah, um, made? it's uh, very important to listen to the feedback and to learn from it, but uh, also not um, have ideas based on the feedback, but rather come up with your own stuff, but your own stuff needs to be uh, to take into account that feedback. So basically what I'm saying by that is if a client tells you do that, you do not necessarily need to do that. You just need to listen to the idea behind and the needs and the feedback that he gave you and mm-hmm. then trying to come, try to come up with your idea uh, how to better solve because that person might not know how to best solve his problem. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, the, the for example, the uh, shopper scan, right? Nobody told us how to do it, but we saw an interest for the data. How mm-hmm. to, can we uh, know more on what's happening at the shelf? Then with the Visi Bubble, we learned from uh, some of the challenges we had with sh- uh, Shelfobot. You know, how c- can you uh, make it, uh, you know, uh, scale it better? How can you not depend on electricity from the, you know, retailers? How can you implement it in uh, in um, other types of stores? How can you make it more omnichannel? So this kind of stuff we learned, mm-hmm. but we try to come up with our own stuff, not to just uh, blindly kind of taking the feedback and uh, just putting it into a product. So if I were to give you a feedback, for example, um, don't I think we need also uh, an AI bot on our app, on our shopping app, because a lot of we see a lot of users shopping mm-hmm. online. Mm-hmm. And would you consider, like, for example, tapping into AI and creating a, a bot that will jump out of, instead of having a banner, mm-hmm. To showcase a product mm-hmm. or something will be an AI bot that you could chat about a certain product while scrolling. Yeah, well, actually, actually well, I'm not sure what <laughs> you are saying, actually, but uh, Visibubble has an AI component also. Oh, okay. So uh, there is this function where uh, you have the interaction with the Visibubble. It's like a mini ecosystem, right? Mm-hmm. So it's you have the physical speech bubble that. Uh, it's uh, near the product, the physical product. So the product kind of speaks with you with a physical WhatsApp, let's say. Mm-hmm. Okay. But once you scan a QR code, you get to continue this conversation on mm-hmm. WhatsApp. 
and the conversation is AI generated mm-hmm. so you can actually ask things about ingredients uh, you know actually everything that you even crazy stuff and you can have a conversation with uh, with the product so it's like mm-hmm. an chat GPT but specialized to be like that product right yes I, w- uh, I understand this for the physical shopping but what happens with like data from shopping that happens online for example mm-hmm. using apps to instead of going to the grocery yeah. you use apps to order I'm not gonna give names but mm, I would see a bot jumping there hey and we have a oh, okay. discount <laughs> <laughs> How do you measure the success of a tokenoma campaign? Mm-hmm. There are uh, many ways, but one of the main uh, measurements is indeed uh, the you know the sales data. Mm-hmm. So uh, basically, how impactful we were and what is the difference? You know, like uh, uh, how tokenoma can uh, impact uh, the, can impact the, the sales in, with. Uh, some comparing to some other stores that didn't have uh, tokenomo mm-hmm. and uh, other ways is uh, of course uh, you can have uh, if we for example increase the dwell time or if we uh, increase the number of times the qr codes were scanned there are a couple of metrics but i would say sales is probably still mm-hmm. and uh, by sales i don't mean necessarily Sometimes it means that uh, I mean we cannot solve uh, the sales forever for brands by just by using our solution. But what mm-hmm. we do, we make people try out your product, and uh, some of them will uh, hopefully become loyal long term if the product is good and uh, has a you know like a long term benefit for them. Mm-hmm. So this is what we are doing best. Um, thank you. Um, we, we these days we talk so much about data access. We we gather data. We don't know how to use it, but. I want to take a step back from you, you wearing the entrepreneur, the business person mm-hmm. hat and step into the um, recovering introvert or upgrading mm-hmm. okay. introvert, for example. How do you balance the benefits of technology, of evolution, of data with concerns when it comes to privacy and data mm-hmm. protection? And as an introvert and a business person, how do you see this? Where is mm-hmm. the balance? That's a very complex discussion. Uh, first of all, I, th- I think that, uh, of course, privacy is important, and that's why even our data collection uh, solution is very much, uh, it started from the idea of being uh, you know, ethical and uh, uh, not uh, touching uh, you know, the privacy of uh, individuals. But on the other hand, I think also that too much regulation and done kind of blindly also restricts kind of the business. I mean, sometimes I, I miss the days when everything was possible <laughs> because, I don't know, okay, they were annoying, the pop-up banners, the, I don't know, whatever, mm-hmm. but you didn't have to click so many times, yes, I agree, yes, yes okay, I agree with this, uh, you know, mm-hmm. all this stuff some t- and the regulations and the GDPR and the company need to go to this process. And so it's like the, there are companies who are making probably more money than you by uh, kind of uh, allowing you to comply with those rules, you know, it's like, like, so I think these rules should be somehow, okay, they are good, They're, they need to be cer- certain rules, but also uh, they need somehow to help, you know, and I think some of the rules are not greatly implemented in my opinion, so, you know, but it's a process, you know, maybe in a few years things will improve on that. And now, of course, on when you are talking about AI, that's like I, I'm not sure if I should uh, open this chapter, but it's a, of course it's a big uh, it's a big it topic. Is. I mean, we definitely need an AI to to click accept on all those rules mm-hmm. in a way, our own personal bot. Talking a mom from uh, data but please update it uh, has been on the market for over five years i would say uh, now we are uh, turning into our fifth year okay you are present in around 40 countries yeah more than 40 countries yeah. you have raised two million euros more these are sort of the numbers <laughs> everything is like more <laughs> you have three products coming yeah. uh, you have over 20 um, members in the team more than 20 members. more than 20 and we, let's add another number yeah. clients how many clients do you have more than <laughs> uh, we have depends on what you mean by clients. So we are operating mainly through partners. Okay. And uh, I would say uh, 
together with our partners, we have so many clients that uh, probably I should better count the ones that we are not working with <laughs> from the okay. FMCG space. Okay. But we also have some direct clients, but uh, not so many because it is very difficult to operate directly in so many countries uh, mm -hmm. and usually uh, work in uh, some countries and uh, of course in Romania also the more direct to, with the clients. I'm curious how, about the go-to-market go feedback mm -hmm. when it comes to traditionalists that are were like, what is this? And even marketers. Yeah. yeah. How, what, what was the feedback there? That is... Uh, that actually, it's a good question, but uh, it's not so easy. We... Whenever you are disrupting something, mm -hmm. uh, you will always upset somebody. Okay. And uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, you... There are people who are used to doing the same old thing and uh, nobody argues with, with, I mean, everybody is doing uh, flyers, right? mm -hmm. how, how they used to, right? Everybody was doing it, so yeah, I mean, it's, nobody will argue, you know? Un until somebody comes with a completely different thing which is better. And like it happened with the email, you know? Mm -hmm. Initially, everybody thought it was stupid. Why not sending letters? And now it's unimaginable how to live without it. So somehow we are trying to impose a new standard and mm -hmm. that uh, means convincing people that it's better, which is better, by the way. So I, I honestly believe our solution is the best solution in the world in terms of in-store marketing. Honestly, I mean, it's you not should, a lie. as the founder. <laughs> you yeah, should. <laughs> but it's very hard to convince some people who are used to uh, do this uh, the same thing and also uh, some of the people in marketing are not actually uh, early adopters just by you know nature mm -hmm. uh, they are you know doing their job the, to the best of their abilities uh, but it takes some vision some courage with the early adopters to like in everything mm -hmm. to uh, try out new new stuff and the rest of course they will see the others and if uh, it's a success then they will eventually pick it up so uh, pick it up so uh, we are in the still in the process you know of uh, of doing that so i would say being innovative is our biggest advantage but also our biggest disadvantage in the same time mm -hmm. thank you um... I wanna, I wanna use this uh, memento momentum to to um, go a little bit philosophical in a way. Oh. Does the success of both and AI reflect a desire for connection? For example, for talking to people in a supermarket, mm. for asking questions. Hey, do yeah. you think this is better or this is better? Or does it demonstrate a willingness to prioritize efficiency over human interaction? Uh -huh. I want this information now. I don't want to go after somebody to get that uh -huh. information. Why well, it must be one or the other. Why? I mean, I think they can both uh, you know, be true. So I think it actually is both. For you? Tell me about your opinion. How do you see it? Uh, you as a shopper, new, yeah, not you as, as a, a uh, an entrepreneur. Um... Do you want to connect? Do you want to talk to people? Or do you no. want more information about that product? I'm an introvert, so an I, introvert. Hate, I hate people. So, hate no, people. I love robots, but I hate people. <laughs> no, not you, of course. <laughs> I love you. Hello, I will okay. speak this now. <laughs> yeah, by the way, just for people who don't know, we actually don't do humanoid robots like, you know, yes. like no. this. Okay. So. <laughs> okay, uh, let's end on a visionary note. Looking back on your career so far, what are some of the moments or accomplishments uh, that you're most proud of and keeps you going? Not saying I'm done, uh, if this, I'm done, mm -hmm. I'm no longer being an entrepreneur, I'm going back to art directing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and tell us this while looking forward um, towards the goals of Tokinomo, growing the company. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think uh, personally, Although I tend to be quite critical of me, I, I think I need, and people have said this to me, that I need also to look at the you know, positives and try to somehow be proud of myself, right? Which I tend not to be, by the way. But uh, I cannot help but notice that I did, uh, I was forced somehow to improve in certain areas, right? Like, for example, pub public speaking. Mm -hmm. Even this interview, I mean, I don't know how I did, but I think 
I did a, a, at least mediocre, okay? So you did good. <laughs> okay, so uh, I, back in the days, I was like not uh, even willing to uh, mm -hmm. show on a, up on a you know on a camera. So I was very you know shy, and uh, I didn't want to be in the spotlight. Uh, so that is that. Then uh, of course, uh, running, uh, leading people. I mean, that was uh, it's one thing to lead yourself to be a group of friends like one two okay it's not really leading but it's it's you know some sort of small leadership there but when you are you know expanding mm -hmm. and people are naturally looking up to you somehow i mean they're expecting stuff so you need to prove yourself or although you didn't ask for this you know i mean you kind of ask because you started it but you don't imagine all this mm -hmm. you know, process. So, in a way, being forced to grow as a person, I think that uh, certainly somehow I'm forcing myself to uh, feel proud <laughs> somehow. And uh, But it is, uh, objectively speaking, I think it's an accomplishment somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, learning new stuff, new... So, we are dealing with so many geographies people in so many countries with uh, you know people from japan china for example i didn't even know that there were so many japanese people in brazil right so dealing with a japanese uh, person who has both cultures kind of you know brazilian port mm -hmm. speaking portuguese but still very japanese at core it's like very it's just as an, ex as an example yeah. but we spoke I don't know with Swahili Zulu I don't know whatever mm -hmm. so it's very interesting but also you need to adapt and I, I don't think with uh, by being just a regular guy and working in a whatever company you have the chance to get out of your comfort zone and to learn so many things mm -hmm. so what's next for Tokinomo in the following 12 months Right, so first of all, we are uh, very proud of these products and we are uh, really want to scale them up. Mm -hmm. But also, we now we can name ourselves that we are not we are no longer a one product company, so we mm -hmm. are trying to build an ecosystem of solutions that will help uh, re both retailers and CPG brands to be more successful. And uh, we are planning to expand on that. We have some pretty big plans also for the coming years and some of the ideas which I don't necessarily want to share but I think they are pretty surprising and uh, pretty ambitious and uh, I'm quite uh, you know confident uh, about uh, our future and yeah it started like uh, maybe a gadget a small quirky idea but now it turns out that uh, we have a, somehow a company some you know tens of uh, em uh, employees, uh, many, I don't know, it's uh, mm -hmm. somehow a miracle, but I'm grateful. So. Well, we can't wait to follow your journey more into becoming an introvert, extrovert, ambivert. <laughs> Thank you so much, the recursive community. Thank you uh, for our, to our guests today. And if you want to keep up with us, follow us on all the channels. Next on the recursive podcast entrepreneur and investor Andrei Pitish. There's this test, uh, we use it also in Innovation Habits, it's Tell called me. PCM, Process Communication Model. It's, mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, and th there's a test, and I, I always thought I was a, a thinker, you know, because, you know, I was good at math when I was uh, young, so I thought, you know, I'm a thinker. But no, I mean, I took this test and uh, it turns out I'm a promoter, which is like 5% of the people in the world. I mean, I do something, and then I think if it was good or not, you know. So, <laughs> okay. so, the, so the entrepreneurs are the ones that do, okay. not the ones that think. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if you are just as passionate about innovation as we are, hit subscribe for the Recursive Podcast on YouTube or your favorite podcast platform. We're everywhere.